And now we're going to have a conversation on things that impact all of us. So I am thrilled to, sh to introduce you to my friend, Nick Shipley. And Nick flew in just to be with you at lunch today. <laughs> uh, and then we'll be flying out shortly thereafter. Um, because there are a few things going on in DC at the moment. Um, but Nick, you know, you and I talk sometimes more than you probably would like. Uh, um, but give them just a little feel for who's Nick Shipley and what do you do? <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, super excited to be here. Uh, and I, I did fly all the way out because I actually always feel like it's really important to encourage advocacy back in the, back in the states and, and kind of engagement in that way. Um, and I am based in Washington, D.C. I work on the chief advocacy officer at BIO. Uh, I have been in and around the politics and policy for this industry uh, for going on uh, 20 years here. I started out as a, as a, a lowly staffer. Uh, on the Hill for a guy named Jay Inslee, who's now the governor in Washington State. Uh, I was there for uh, the, uh, the Medicare Modernization Act, which gave us the uh, Part D uh, drug benefit back in 2003. Uh, was there for uh, the Biosimilars Pathway that eventually got tacked onto ACA uh, in 2010. Um, eventually left the Hill, did consulting for the industry for a little while, and then did a turn in uh, in pharma, the trade association for the large uh, multinational manufacturers, uh, for about seven and a half years. Um, and before joining Bio uh, a, a year ago in, in this current role. Um, and really, you do get to see a much wider breadth of the industry um, than you do. I think it's really easy uh, to get lost and just assuming that some of the larger multinationals are, are the universe when there's so much more and there's so many more companies um, and I, I, I am excited to be here because I do think it's, it's an important time like you said there is a lot going on. Well thank you for being here I really appreciate it and I mean there, there's storms happening in the eastern United States and not all of them are weather related at the oh. moment. Um, so tomorrow is the last day of the fiscal year. Um, Short-term political predictions are usually safer than long-term ones uh, what's going to happen? So, uh, we, we did get down to the wire on the um, keeping the, the government open. There will not be a shutdown. I was actually just checking my, uh, my email before I came up on stage and confirmed the Senate is voting on their continuing resolution, which will have their budget funding. The House is going to vote on it tomorrow, on the last day. Um, and so that'll keep, keep going. More importantly, for our purposes in this industry, is they attach to that vehicle um, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. Um, I should also, I, I focus on the prescription drug part, it also has the medical device user fees, the generics user fees, all the, the user fees, um, the, the you know, glamorously named UFAs, uh, as, we, as we call them back east. Um, those uh, also going down to the wire, they expire on, on September 30th. I don't think most people realize, especially if you're outside the industry, how important that program is. Um, if just on the, uh, the drug review program alone, we were talking to, F to FDA, if that funding stream had, ex had expired, if it had lapsed, um, they would have been handing out pink slips to about 4,000 employees. Uh, if there's not a functioning FDA drug review program, no one's products are, get are getting through. Uh, I think we were particularly worried about the kind of fiscal health uh, of some of our smaller and mid-sized companies with October and November uh, PADUFA dates. If you had a review date in that time frame, you were really in danger of having it slip. We are, you know, candidly dealing with a, a bit of a bear market that we're trying to come out of. If you're a smaller company, a mid-sized company, and you that that's your first product or maybe your second product getting out there, the financial runway was. I mean, you know, it's not, it's not quite as robust as, you, as you'd like to be in some cases, and I, I think we were very worried for a while. Um, but it looks like they will get that done for the core user fee reauthorization piece. It'll be a full five-year reauthorization, so you will not uh, have to hear about this for, for a little while. Um, but they will come back to some of this. They're, they were working on a whole bunch of policy riders, and I know you wanted to ask about some of them. Um, none of those made it into this bill. Yeah. Uh, this is going to be a, cl a, cl a clean version, but it's got a promise that they're going to come back to some of those in the, in the lame duck. And they put a little bit of a, of a trigger in there, uh, some very minor expirations on, uh, on some programs to try to force people to redo the debate in December. Uh, we'll see how effective that is, but that's, that's their intent right now. So we come up with some really creative names for things. What's a lame duck? <laughs> 
Um, well, the lame duck session is basically any congressional session that happens after an election. The election happens in November, but as most of you probably know, new members aren't sworn in until January. And there is this very awkward period on Capitol Hill where members come back because they have things they've got to vote on, usually related to expiring programs that are expiring on the calendar year. Uh, and it's always kind of curious to see who lost their election in November and just doesn't bother showing up who you know, suddenly is a little freer hand in how they're voting, uh, and who's retiring, and maybe this is their last chance at a legacy project. Our, uh, one, a big champion for the industry, Senator Byrne in North Carolina, will be retiring. He's going to have a lot of priorities that he's going to try to cram into the uh, two-week session there at the very end of the year. Um, but that is a typical lame duck session, is a bunch of retiring members who just can't count on them even showing up, let alone how they're going to they're gonna vote at the end of the day. So. Some of those things that are kind of on the table. So one is the Valid Act. So what yes. is the Valid Act, and what does that mean for patients and for highly concentrated diagnostics industries like Arizona's? So the Valid Act uh, has been kind of uh, something that uh, you mentioned Richard Burr, or I mentioned Richard Burr. Mm -hmm. He has uh, worked on this for about 10 years now. Um, it's about getting standards on the clinical lab diagnostics. They do not exist really right now in any robust form or fashion. It's very hodgepodge. Uh, and it is something that is a really big deal to him. He wants to see uh, the kind of that gold standard that, uh, that the FDA represents for the drug review industry kind of carried over to that side. I think it will be meaningful for patients to kind of to have that to see that um, for how those those uh, diagnostic therapies get through the process um, is a really big deal. I think it's going to become a more important deal in the future. Uh, we are in an age where things like biomarkers, precision medicine, these terms get thrown around a lot. All those things have a diagnostic component that you didn't have in a previous generation of of medicine. The FDA didn't have. Uh, to worry about a diagnostic component when they're setting up a small molecule review program. They, that, that wasn't on their, on their radar. And now um, it's a really big deal. You know, the, when we're looking at oncology nowadays, the screening around, uh, around cancer and, and the tumors and identifying it with biomarkers, and I know we, we talked about um, the great work the state has done on biomarkers in Arizona, uh, those are increasingly important. So that things like the Valid Act, getting, uh, getting more rigor around diagnostics, Doing so in a way that doesn't squash the whole, you know, diagnostics industry actually, uh, you know, kind of rewards the innovation in the space. Um, it's going to be really important. Well, I think you know, as we look at the next generation, and and um, when Arizona passed House Bill twenty one forty four, which for those of you that are not policy wonks, um, what that meant was that if you live in the state of Arizona and you have either state insurance, Medicaid, small group, or private insurance. So not the big ERISA plans, not Medicare or, or VA. Then if your doctor says you need a biomarker test to either manage or detect your disease, and that test has gone through either an FDA, CMS, or peer-reviewed credentialed process, your, your insurance company has to pay for it. That was one of the biggest steps that we've made on behalf of patients in this state in years. And Arizona and Illinois are the only two states that have it. So they're used to me saying, I want stuff. <laughs> I want to pass the Arizona law in Washington, DC, so it benefits all patients, not just cancer patients. How do we get that done? Well, I think it's uh, the, the simplest way to start is with the Arizona and Illinois delegations, bringing them on board as champions for the work they've done at the state level. It's almost, there's, there's an old cliche about states being the, the laboratories of democracy um, for DC. What that really means is it's really easy for a federal representative to look and say, we do this in my state already, I like it, let's take it nationwide. Uh, and that's something that you, you guys have in this, in Arizona in particular, is a delegation that gets a lot of attention because it's a swing state. So both sides are, are watching it, worrying, trying to do favors, et cetera. Um, you know, I think that's you know, something that, it, that they, they can use to their, to their advantage in terms of getting policies uh, passed. 
Uh, I think that's something that, that would be the, the hands down, you know, where, where you would start. Uh, and again, I think that's why, you know, this is an important time. I'll get a little bit on, on my soapbox here. You know, when you, when you look at the elected representatives in D.C., you know, we, we expect a lot of them. They're, you know, leaders on policy. But at the end of the day, they are humans who in a previous life were the locally elected sheriff. They were a lawyer. They were a real estate agent. They weren't scientists. They didn't, you know, discover drugs in a lab. They, most of them aren't doctors. Um, you know, there's like 20 doctors in all of Congress. So it's not exactly a hotbed of science. So having this community engaged with the members is really important. Because otherwise, they, they will just not instinctually know what a biomarker is or what it means or what that bill does or how it interacts. That's something that you know, we, we have to educate them about. You know, you'll find, I, I would challenge anyone to go into a meeting and have the, someone, an elected official, tell you that they're against innovation, that they're, I'm the anti-innovation candidate. No, they, they're all gonna say they're pro-innovation, they all wanna be pro-innovation, but honestly, you guys are the ones who actually have to tell them what that really means. You know, it's moving it from like the bumper sticker on a campaign poster uh, slogan to, you know, actual policy that, you know, and incentives that reward innovations, things like the biomarker uh, initiative. Those are something that they're going to have to hear about locally uh, and say, hey, this is an, the, the, an industry that's important to me, to my state, economic development cares about this and it's, and it, and it's needed. Uh, and that's, that's, you just can't beat that. So, you know, another thing that is getting hopefully renewed this week is the SBIRS TTR yes. program, although there have been some changes and it's a short renewal. I think it's only three years. It is a shorter renewal this time, but it, <coughs> is, it did indeed happen. Um, the vote on that one has already happened in the Senate and it is supposed, was supposed to be in the House yesterday, um, got delayed. We're expecting by, um, you know, kind of end of end of voting day back on the East Coast. Um, they will have passed that and it'll be ready to sail off to um, the president's desk. Shorter, but for, Quite, quite candidly, for a while, we were really worried about it. Um, the, the junior senator in Kentucky, Senator Rand Paul, had, it had very unspecified objections to the program that none of us could figure out for a really long time. Uh, thankfully, other people in the Senate finally were just like, look, if you can't make clear what your concern is, we're, we're just gonna do this. And that's, that's finally what happened. So I'm... Um it's interesting, though, that a lot of times when you talk about the SBIR and STR program for many of the companies in this room, um, their work would not have progressed without that program. And they continue to rely on it. Um, we also see programs, and, and this is one of my pet peeves, is that you know, there are some conditions that are grossly underfunded and need solutions, and they're not necessarily good business cases for investors. Um, here in Arizona, Valley Fever is a really good example of that. We have the Valley Fever Caucus. We have Valley Fever Research Centers. But when we actually want to get a medicine through the process, there's no dollars to do that. And a clinical trial, even for an orphan disease like that, you're talking between 12 and 25 million dollars. So how can we, you know, advocate for these programs? Number one, if they're renewing in three years, we have to start working on building the body of effort, of evidence for that now to get that renewal through. Um, how, what, you know, we go to fly-ins, we meet at district offices, we have people come to visit our companies. What are some of the things nationally that you have seen that are most effective? So the, uh, the, the sad truth about a lot of um, kind of policy making in healthcare is that it's done by anecdote. It is not an overwhelming great pile of data that shows you know, this trend in health. It is that an important senator or member of Congress has a favored aunt or brother or son who gets an unfortunate diagnosis and suddenly they are saying, we need to put more money into this space. We need to put more resources there. That's an un impossible loop to break. It is kind of part of just the, the way humans seem to be hardwired. You care about someone you, and you wanna push dollars in that direction. So short of that, um, I think the best thing you can do that we've seen, um, I always think, particularly for our industry, is getting people to facilities to actually visit it. I think we have uh, suffered immensely over the past two years on the pandemic. 
where members of Congress became very detached from our industry in particular, but others too, but ours in particular, in terms of seeing what it means to invest. You mentioned the cost of a clinical mm -hmm. trial. Like, I don't think people gra on the Hill grasped what it meant to bring a product to market. Uh, it was just this kind of like figment of their imagination, a few numbers on the page, but actually taking them to see, you know, the scientists at work, seeing the capital investment that's required is, uh, is, is, is very impactful, it's very meaningful. Um, I think, so that's something that I, I think I always come back to uh, of late, just because we lost so much of it over the last two years with, uh, with, 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 you know, we had the pandemic, um, and a lot of companies just haven't brought it back. It's, it's work, it's, you know, everyone here has a, you know, has a, has a day job. You're all trying to run companies. I, when I was at Pharma, I used to give a, a presentation where I tried to tell all of our CEOs, I, I hope they visited us less. I hope they stopped calling me because it meant we were doing a good job in DC keeping things, you know, kind of on, on a steady keel and they could go run their companies. That applies even more so in the, in the bio context because, you know, in a smaller mid-sized companies, you don't have, a, you know, a multi giant multinational workforce to rely on. You know, you're, you're a lot of times for some of our smallest guys, some, some of you probably in, in this room, you know, you're, you're, you're literally the inventor patent holder and you're the marketing officer and you're the, you're the general counsel, you're just everything all at once. So I think that's something that, uh, you know, is a real challenge to ask uh, in terms of like advocacy and engagement and saying, hey, carve out time and invite, you know, the senator, the congressman to come visit the facility. Um, but it is probably the most impactful thing for them to have that on the ground experience because it also ties it directly to their state or district as well. Um, which is a, a really big deal. I think for a lot of um, our industry, you know, the perception is that we're just in Boston and San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people appreciate the level of development that has gone on in places like Arizona um, and, you know, and, and other, other kind of places around the country that, you know, these are the exact, this is the type of industry that everyone wants to attract, you want to build it. So having it connected in the state, in the district is, is a really big deal as well. So, you know, you said district a couple of times, and I think that is really important. Um, so often, you know, the perception is, I have to get on an airplane and I have to fly to Washington, D.C. But the reality is, is that our um, representatives and our senators have phenomenal teams that are actively engaged in our communities and are, want to learn and want to see um, how important is it to, you know, be engaged with your district office, build those relationships, and not just be the person that's asking them for, for things, but be the person that can be a resource for them? Uh, that's super important, and that last part you said I could not agree more. Being a resource for them, establishing that relationship so that they can, they might ask you a question about a science policy that isn't necessarily super related to, to your business or what you're doing, your therapeutic space, but they trust you to be an honest broker on that information, and that's really important. Because that means in three months when you're coming back around and you're saying, hey, I need help on something, they are, you know, you have an established relationship. It's not just, as you said, you going in and saying like, ooh, I need, I need, I need this, I need that, I need, you know, which usually relates to money, and that's, that, you know, always gets uncomfortable. So I think it is, it's really important. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a really big proponent of, uh, of, of engagement back in the state and in the district. I, you know, I think there, for a while, there was this perception that you had to prove to members of Congress that this was important enough for me to get on the airplane and fly to DC. Um, but at the end of the day, it didn't, you know, those meetings are actually um, not always great. You know, your, your schedule is packed. They got a committee hearing, they got a vote. They got, you know, 15 minutes to, to jam you in there while, you know, you got to walk and talk like you're in an Aaron Sorkin, you know, drama. And it's, it's not great. Usually it's a more relaxed meeting in the district or, or state. And it can be a little bit longer, a little bit, you know, kind of, um, you know, just a little friendlier. And so I do think uh, it, it's a really big piece of it. Everyone has a district office, a state office. They've got a state director, district director. Those are important contacts. Those are people that are going to be the ones that the, the member relies on to say, like, what's important in my state? What's, a, what's important? Who are the important companies, the important industries that I need to watch out for? Because they're going to get, you know, an endless number of request to sign a letter, vote for this, vote for that. You know, there are, we're, we're, we're over 6,000 bills introduced in the House already. 
I don't think any member knows them all. They don't have an opinion on them all. But at any given time, like someone might walk in their office and say, what about HR 5266? And you know, you're like, <laughs> I'm going to have to get back to you on that. Um, that's, that's not my experience or anything. But uh, you know, those, that's where you have a, you know, if you're in DC, you're calling the district director and you're saying, that, hey, I got a bill here. It's about reimbursement on, the, you know, the, on this issue. Does this affect anyone in the district? Does it affect anyone in the state? The district director is who you're calling about that. The district director is who's going to know, oh, yeah, I did a meeting with three companies the other day. Valley fever is actually a really big deal here. We should, we should, it's an orphan drug or orphan disease, so we should look for orphan drug innovation. Let's, let's co-sponsor that bill. That's a, that's a very you know, meaningful way for that advocacy to work. So co-sponsors. So there have been bills that our community has worked on. And, and you'll see enough co-sponsors that it's the majority of Congress, but the bill still doesn't move. How, how can they have enough co-sponsors <laughs> to pass the bill, but it never gets to the floor? So this is, uh, <laughs> this is where it gets tricky to explain, right? The, you know, you, you can have a majority of, of, your, uh, of, of the House co-sponsoring a bill, but nothing goes to the floor by itself. You have to have the leadership of the majority party agree to put something on there. They set the voting calendar, and there are all sorts of things that they can kind of put up there and say, like, well, you haven't gone through the committee process yet. You haven't done X, Y, or Z things yet. Sometimes the bills, you know, candidly, you see bills that are drafted that will cost money because they are a tax cut or a reimbursement increase, um, but there's no offset in there because no one likes to actually put the offsets in there because that's you just get you just get criticized for that. You're taking money away from someone, um, but without the offset, it's not compliant with PAYGO rules, so it can't actually be on the floor. So there's all these like little moments of parliamentary you know hoops that you got to jump through that are they're there to slow things down. Ultimately, at the end of the day. Having the co-sponsors, having them, them, them on there is, is a very important moment. They're, they're certainly not moving a bill that is going to have like three co-sponsors on it. Um, you know, they're they're going to want to see a base of support. And usually there are some other things you got to jump through to get there. Um, is it bipartisan? Is it paid for? All that stuff. Um, but you, you got you to kind of start with the, that base of support. And the, the co-sponsorship really is the best way to show it. So, and then we see bills that pass without bipartisanship. <laughs> um, the Inflation Reduction Act is probably a good example of one of those. Yes. So, didn't love that bill. Didn't like it. <laughs> Wasn't a big fan. Um, let me, let me take the first part first. The, part, the partisanship, you know, I, I think it's, it's become a little, a little cliche at this point to talk about partisanship has increased. It's true. It has. Um, the fact that that bill was done and, uh, via that uh, kind of parliamentary process, you probably heard the word reconciliation thrown around a lot. It just meant a particular parliamentary process where you only needed 50 votes in the Senate. You didn't have to get to 60 votes. It came with limitations about what you could put in the bill, um, but that was the whole point of it. The, that is increasingly just the way things are done now. You know, the, uh, there were the two biggest bills uh, that the Democrats did uh, were under reconciliation because they were just going to be only Democratic votes for those bills. One was the Inflation Reduction Act. There was a, a, a pandemic relief bill that was earlier in the, in the process. When the Republicans were in the majority, they did two bills that way. And it's, it's one, one was their tax cut. Um, and actually, they failed on their second one. That was when they were trying to repeal ACA. So that was I take, our senator. I take that back, yes. Yes, <laughs> no. you guys should know. Um, but anyway, let's, so the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that one. That's, that's a, a really unfortunate bill in the sense that I, I think it showed how much of a gap there is between that moment where you have members saying they're pro-innovation uh, and then what they're actually doing in terms of enacting policies. Because that was the first time you saw Congress put hard price caps, uh, literally a, a formula in statute on reimbursement, you know, they called it negotiation. My view on it, it's not really negotiation if you just dictate the price in the law, and then you know, if you walk away, you get a 95% tax, ta tax it. Like that's not really a negotiation. It's pretty clear what is going to be on the balance sheet for me. Um, but 
there was just a lot of policies that, that were very anti-innovation in there that are going to put a lot of strain uh, on, a lot of, on a lot of companies in the industry. Uh, it is something that I, I think is, is pretty unfortunate. Um, there was the, you know, in addition to that uh, kind of um, price, the price control they put in there, there was an inflation price, uh, price cap they put in there, uh, which is also, you know, going to, again, add some strain to people as they're trying to, you know, manage the life cycle of their products. Um, we, we did see, you know, a patient out-of-pocket cap in Part D. That was an important advance for, for patients. I, you know, I'll give credit where credit's due on that. Um, but at some point, you know, you do have to worry about how companies are going to start making new judgment calls on, uh, as they manage their, manage their pipelines. And one of the things we've talked a lot about is this new split between small molecules and large molecules. Large molecules got a longer runway on, uh, on, on being able to have, have control over their own, setting their own price. Small molecules got three years less. Um, what that means is there's going to be a lot more hard decisions made about do I invest in this in small molecules? Am I going to buy, am I you know investing in, in, in small companies that's got a promising pipeline, but it's a small molecule you know pipeline versus a large molecule pipeline? I'm not going to be over the top. I think there's been some bombastic comments about like everyone's going to just walk away from small molecules forever. I don't I don't think that's going to happen. I think people you know if there's a particularly compelling case, people will still invest. Um, but I do think you will lose, you know, you mentioned, you know, an orphan uh, disease like valley fever. I mean, that's where I worry about it. If, you know, you've got, uh, if you're sitting in a company and you've got to make judgments about, hey, do we keep the R&D going on large molecule X or small molecule Y, you know, if small molecule Y is treating an orphan drug or an orphan disease class, so the, it's already, you know, kind of questionable on the return. It's it's probably going to be tough to justify that going forward, and that's that's going to suck for you know a lot of a lot of different disease states, and I, I think we're going to see that um, kind of play out over over a period of time. You know, a lot of the implementation dates have a little bit of a stagger to them; it'll be a couple years out. But I think we will start to see those investment decisions st start to impact um, the, you know right away. I think you, we've seen some companies already talk about you know we we are going to change. Eli Lilly's CEO had a investor call where he was very very upfront about it um, that this will affect their their behavior. Well, I think the other thing is, is you know, when we, we think about the bigs, right, because a small or a mid-cap company is not likely to have their drug on that top 10 hit list, which, you know, it's 10 the first year, plus 15 the next to a total of 25, right. plus and plus. So it's not... It's not 10, 15, 20, 25. It starts going up geometrically. But the, I, I mean, I, I love Pfizer and I love Lilly and, okay, but they can afford it. They're profitable. And a lot of our innovators who are working so hard to bring the next cure that Pfizer or Lilly will buy someday, um, they're already having conversations with the VCs, because I've been in mm -hmm. some of those mm -hmm. conversations recently. Um, and one of our serial entrepreneurs recently wrote on RA Capital's blog about the fact that um, you know, these small companies that are looking for that first Series A, Series B, Series C, before they hit the billion dollar clinical trial large scale. Um, the money's gonna dry up because they don't see that return on investment. We're already seeing the 13 by nine, the nine and 13 um, conversations happening. We are seeing um, people come and say, you know what, there's more money over here to support aging than there is kids. Why don't you just, you know, Instead of doing something to help children, why don't you go over here and help, help the elderly? Are we going to start making decisions on how we innovate for health based on arbitrary policy implications that people didn't think through? I think the important answer is, is probably yes. I, I, I agree with you. We've talked to some of the venture community. This is already weighing on them. Um, you know, it's probably, you know, they're, they're, they're you know, they, they've got a lot of money out there. They're not going to suddenly, like, pull it all back. But, like, as they look at the next investment they make, that's where we're going to start to see things. And I, I don't think people have kind of thought through. I know they didn't think through 
um, how this was going to start affecting things on a therapy by therapy basis. They weren't thinking about how you know neurology has to be small molecule basically. Like the mm -hmm. way the way you know the science works, it, you know it's it's almost Can't certainly has to blood be. brain barrier. Yeah, right. exactly, and and it's just you know you kind of really. You know, I, and I can't emphasize this enough. We we were all kind of like excited about the news that just came out around and, and Alzheimer's over the last you know forty eight hours. But up until that moment, neurology had had a terrible year. Like they, you know, they were really were already down. And so now you're coming out and laying this on top of it and saying, all right, your small molecules are getting less of a have less of a return on the investment. I just cannot imagine walking into you know RA Capital or, or whatever other venture firm and saying, "Here is my neurology you know project. Here's my neurology you know company." Um, it just would be a really hard sell, uh, and I do think there will be there will be impacts on that sort of thing. I, I think that's something we will increasingly see, and I, I think also you know the the staff, the policymakers on the Hill. They they do have a tendency to see the big names that they all, that they know and think you're well capitalized. I can read your your stock reports. You're, you're going to be fine. We can, and I, we can debate that, you know. But I think what they what they do miss is that it is an innovation ecosystem. It's not like you you don't draft this policy and, and it only affects this one company over here that you're sure can can handle the burden. It, it does hit everyone. You know, those large multinational companies, they all have venture funds of their own. They're all like that they invest, that they, they do things with. It is really something that, uh, you know, we're, we're all kind of connected on. Um, and that's why it's so important to really, you know, get these policies right. I don't think they did in this case. I just think they've really kind of got wrapped up in this idea of like, we've got something we can call Medicare negotiation. We're going to do it. We're going to campaign on getting the drug companies and that's that's what we're gonna where we're gonna go I you know you and I have talked about this I, I do say hats off to Senator Cinema. I think she fought to try to protect the innovative industry um, as long as she could with that without a lot of support in her caucus quite frankly um, you know and and I talked to that office uh, myself you know I think they did feel like they they were getting pretty far out on the island so to speak um, but I give them a lot of credit like there was immense political pressure um, because beating up on, on drug companies, because the perception is always it's big pharma, and you know, they're never talking about the smaller companies, but that always pulls well. You know, they, and it's not just on the, on the Democratic side of things. When, uh, when Trump was uh, in his presidency, you know, he was instituting or, or proposing, I should say, he, he kind of failed to get him across the finish line, but he was proposing things like reference pricing. Uh, you know, it's just always good politics in this day and age to beat up on, on quote, big pharma. Um, and that's, that's something that, again, I'll come back to the point I made about advocacy and engagement with, the, with your elected officials. That's why we, we've got a, it's such a crucial time. It's, it's why it's important to get out there now and say, hey, like, you, you know, you gotta understand what you, what, what you did, what the kind of fiscal pressure you, you put us under here. Because um, I'm, you know, we we're trying to be this innovative company. You were trying to tell me you're a pro-innovation candidate. Like, let's, Let's talk about what that actually means. Well, and I think the, it, the unintended consequences, and for those of you that were with us at the AZ Bio Awards last night or today, you'll see the blue magazines on your, your tables. Um, there are some articles in there that step through what the, infl the Inflation Reduction Act is, what are some of the impacts on innovation. These are factual, based on the numbers articles. So this is not grandstanding. But the more that our community, not just people like us, but everybody understands, you know, what the implications of these policy decisions are, we can work forward. We saw that with the medical device tax. So um, when the Affordable Care Act was passed during a lame duck in December, <laughs> right, um, one of the pay-fors to get that through was a medical device excise tax. Yeah. It had an immediate, once it went into effect, it had an immediate negative effect on innovation, which we could document. At that point, we took that data to the Hill and they did adjust. Do we think that, you know, as we see this start to play out, because it's, it's medical devices, I'm not saying medical devices are easy, 
but medical devices have a shorter tail to develop. And so with a drug where a drug can take 10, 15, and sometimes 20 years to develop, mm -hmm. um, we, we won't necessarily know that long-term impact for a while. No, this is a, it's, it's funny. I was doing a, a call earlier today um, with, with a guy who ran uh, uh, Gilead's, um, he was involved in Gilead's venture arm. And this is something we were talking about, is how can you start building the data set and the economic modeling to show policymakers, hey, this, this impact is real. Um, you know, we're, we're all kind of focusing on that 9 versus 13 discrepancy, because I think a lot of us think that's where it's going to be the most evident first. Mm -hmm. The will, if you're tracking, you know, deals and, you know, investment dollars, you'll start to see that shift before it goes into effect. You'll start to see some real impacts there. Um, you know, we're looking at the certain therapy classes, you know, we mentioned neurology, or, uh, oral oncology, which was a promising, you know, class and now maybe not so promising any, anymore. Um, you know, hopefully it's still, I shouldn't be so cavalier about that, but I, I think those are the types of things we are, we're going to have to build the data set for. It is going to be challenging because the, some of these things don't go into effect until 26. Um, the first round of, uh, as you said, uh, of, of drugs that they'll pick uh, are kind of known drugs. They're, they're been in, you know, they've been out there. Um, but also, as you rightly point out, which I think gets glossed over a lot, is they're going to pick that first tranche of 10 drugs. Mm -hmm. And then they go off the list. There's next group they're picking, you know, because they're going off the list because the price is already set. The next group they're picking is the next, you know, the next block 50, or 15 below that. Those guys, they're still cut, the price is still done. So you, you do start to get further and further down this list and further and further kind of into, um, you know, orphan drugs, things, mm -hmm. that, things that, you know, wouldn't be obvious as candidates that, uh, that I think a lot of, you know, policymakers that weren't steeped in the details, um, they just weren't thinking about it. And they didn't, they didn't kind of have it in mind. And so I, I think that's something we will have to, we're gonna have to work hard to kind of, to kind of showcase. Um, it's something this industry, there's another, another component of this, this industry kind of struggles to talk about, um, which is failure. We have a, you know, we do a great job of doing the press release on the successful clinical trial and talking to everyone and giving them the good news. We do not spend a lot of time talking about the nine trials before it that all failed and were incredible sunk cost fallacy moments and, and were bad. Um, I get that, you know, when you're trying to project confidence, raise money, all that stuff, you don't want to spend a lot of time calling the New York Times and saying, hey, I just had another failed I clinical just fell trial. On my sword. <laughs> right, yeah, you know, it was $3 million, $10 million out the door, no big deal, you know, you, that's, that's a tough moment. But I do think we have to find a way, particularly with this, with what's, what's coming down the, the, the pike here on the policy front, we have to find a way to explain that to policymakers. They can't walk out of every meeting and assume every product is, you know, just a blockbuster, that everything is, you know, is a billion dollar drug. They've got to understand everything that happened in between, you know, those moments. Those, the reason that it took 20 years to bring drug X to market was because you had a whole bunch of, of failures in between. You had a whole bunch of moments where, you know, you, you walked down into the scientific cul-de-sac and had to throw up your hands and say, hey, we gotta go back and start over. And, and those are moments that, you know, we, we don't talk a lot about, and if you think back what I said earlier, if you're the new freshman member of Congress from Kansas and your last job was being a sheriff or a teacher or whatever, like, why would you know? Why, you know, why, why would we expect you to have this steep knowledge about what it means to develop a drug? We've got to engage, we've got to talk to them about it, we've got to explain about it. It doesn't have to be in the New York Times. It can be, you know, in that district meeting, in the office, sitting there saying, hey, you know, it's great that we got this drug here. We want to tell you everything that meant to get it there and how much, how much investment went into that. About all the clinical trials we did at Arizona State, you know, to, to help develop, develop that. That's an important part of the story that we too often leave, leave on the cutting room floor. Okay. So we're coming up on, you know, the last five or ten minutes of our conversation. So what questions should I have asked you that I didn't? <laughs> um, oh, man. You, we did not talk about intellectual property. Um, <laughs> Which, 
which is kind of a, a weedy technical issue, but one that is lifeblood for, for this industry. I, I'm sure most of you are, are pretty familiar with patents and having um, you know, secure IP when you're going into, into, your, uh, into your meetings. Um, IP is under a lot of assault as well. It doesn't get as much attention as some of the uh, kind of drug pricing fights, um, but there's a lot of pressure on the intellectual property front to essentially, you know, kind of break patents, get compulsory licensing going. There's a whole conversation around, um, around the TRIPS waiver, which is just a fancy way of saying that, you know, the, the, for trade purposes, they want to be able to waive IP um, for anything related to COVID. Uh, they've already done it for the COVID vaccines itself, which is a limited subset of, of products, obviously, um, but now they want to expand that to diagnostics and therapeutics. And that includes a lot of products that people were working on for other diseases that they're now mm -hmm. saying, oh yeah, it might have had, it might have a, a, a purpose. You know, we talked about diagnostics. Mm -hmm. It might have some value in the COVID space. We'll run, you know, we'll do the work. We'll do the tests there. Um, and the, there are countries of the WTO really pushing to say, okay, great, we can waive your IP on that. That's going to have ramifications globally, back here in the U.S., abroad, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, it's really important that members understand the impacts of just kind of cavalierly waving IP and what, and what that means. Uh, if you think members of Congress don't understand drug pricing, let me tell you how many of them understand patent law. <laughs> Not many. Uh, there's one patent attorney in the U.S. Congress um, that, I'm, that I'm aware of. Maybe, maybe someone else is a patent attorney and they're too shy to admit it, but um, it's not, not a great ratio. Uh, super weedy stuff. Not many members on there, but again, it's always popular to beat up on, um, on, on the industry uh, politically, so it's, it's something that gets swept in a lot, and you hear about it in these attacks like waving IP, march in, uh, you know, at the, at, with the NIH where they get to basically take your patents if you've, uh, if you've taken an NIH grant. Um, those are, those are really dangerous policies that don't always get the same, the same attention, um, but ones we should make sure we're all paying attention to. Okay. So, early voting begins in Arizona on October 12th. Yes. Um, oh, and by the way, I'm going to be telling everybody that bioscience votes. Make sure you do. <laughs> we'll never tell you how to vote. But please, please, please vote. It is very, very important. And you know, we currently have some pretty high-profile races going on in Arizona. You do, and I think you will for the foreseeable future. Arizona is really showing itself to be a purple state, a swing state. Uh, there's real value there, as I said earlier, because that means the majority party in Congress always wants to protect their, protect their incumbents from swing states. They want to do a lot of favors for them. Um, and that's something that, that, that plays out. You're about, you, you'll have back-to-back -back cycles of it with uh, the Senate race this time and um, uh, Cinema's race is, is on the next cycle, so you'll, you'll see it again. Um, you know, the Arizona Senate race has gotten a, a lot of attention because of the, at the outset, Kelly was considered to be one of the most vulnerable incumbents um, out there. Uh, the president's party typically loses seats. It's not unusual you know, to see the other, the, the minority party make gains on the off year. Uh, and that's pretty consistent, which, as, you know, as you switch the party's positions back and forth. So I think a lot of people were, were did very much see Mark Kelly as a, as a vulnerable member. Um, he has to, you know, done a, done a really good job raising money uh, and, and, really work, and, and really working hard on the, on the campaign trail. I think, you know, the, the kind of polling aggregate, aggregate that's out there, and I never like to cite just one poll because any, any one poll can be wrong, but if you look at it, there are a couple different, um, you know, kind of places that, that aggregate a lot of polls together to give you a, an average. Um, he's managed to stake out a pretty consistent lead, not a, not a big lead, but one like just outside the margin of error for most of them. Um, so I think you'd have to say the race is tilting in his favor right now. Uh, it's not, uh, it's by no means over. Um, but they're, they're, you know, the fact that early voting is starting right now, I think the, those, that kind of polling average is, is probably more meaningful than in some places where they don't have the same uh, participation of male voting and, and that it's starting so, so soon. So I would, I would give it to the edge to, to Kelly right now. So governors, so we talk about our elected leaders because our, our, our mm -hmm. congressional members, House and Senate, are the ones that pass laws, the executive branch signs the laws, 
the judicial branch that overturns the laws. Um, so I guess that's, that wasn't the appropriate. <laughs> um, Just let it go. Slip, yeah, sorry about that. Um, but as we look at the impact of governors, governors have gotten very, very engaged at the national level. You, we here in Arizona have had Governor Ducey chair of the Republican, mm -hmm. the RGA. The RGA yeah. um, you know, what is the impact when these governors descend on DC and are talking about these issues? How much does it really you know, get notice. It gets noticed. It's, it moves the needle. I think you're right that it is, uh, it is kind of increasingly common to see governors play a, a, a role on the national stage. Um, it used to be the idea that, you know, every senator wanted to be president uh, right away. I think you increasingly see that with governors. Now, uh, you know, in Florida, Ron, you know, DeSantis is all over the news, you know, same way, same way in Texas, that, you know, the Republican primary, you know, there's obviously the you know, Trump as the, as the 800 pound gorilla. But after that, it's, it's pretty wide open. And all those governors are trying to carve, carve names out, carve some platforms out for themselves. Um, so it, it is really meaningful. I think you are also seeing a lot more governors willing to get involved in policy areas that were traditionally reserved uh, or thought of as, as a federal space. And this is a really big deal in healthcare. Um, most healthcare policy making that goes on at the it, for the federal level, kind of, you know, it's Medicare, it just extends everywhere, the FDA, it's, you know, kind of interstate commerce going everywhere. But more and more you're seeing governors step up and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to get involved, I'm going I'm to be a player on this as well. Um, we saw it on, in the negative, there's a program uh, called 340B. It's another, one of those great health programs that does not have a very good acronym to it. It's literally just named after the section of the code that it's in. Um, but 340B is a purely federal program, and it is about giving discounts on, on drugs to hospitals and other covered entities, some of which are maybe more deserving. <coughs> Others, I would have really question whether they need those discounts, so they're, you know, literally the Beverly Hills Hospital and does probably not need those discounts. But, uh, you know, now we are seeing governors and state legislatures get involved in 340B. They're trying to pass their own expansion bills around it um, because they, you know, that's where they want to get involved. They, they don't view it as an obstacle that it's a federal program. They just feel like they can play in that space. I think that's the negative version. The positive version of that is there's a lot of governors, particularly when it comes to our industry, who look at this and say, like, this is part of my economic development plan. Mm -hmm. This is an industry I want to attract to my state. I'm going to, get a, I'm going to grow a biotech hub. Um, I, I'm just about every state has an economic development officer somewhere, you know, who's saying, I'm going to have a biotech hub here. Uh, and it's, and it's, and it's going to come. And it's, it's very true. Some of them, I think, maybe not as realistic as others. Uh, but they're, uh, you know, those, those people who are thinking that way are thinking about what policies can I do to attract, to attract those people? What, what can I do to, like, bring, you know, bring those to, to the states? Look, the, the cost of doing business in, in California, for example, it's, everyone knows it's, it's pretty high. They've, they've got a lot going on, uh, you know, a lot going on there. Um, you're not necessarily going to get everyone to shut down massive capital investments in lab space in San Francisco, but new startups, um, especially as we've all learned lessons out of the pandemic about, you know, distance and remote work, um, I, I think there's a lot more avenues for those to, for those to crop up and, and develop new biotech hubs everywhere. Maybe not in all 50 states. Still working on the Hawaii chapter, but uh, <laughs> you and um, me both, yeah. They, uh, but yeah, but you're, I think you're, I think you're going to see a lot more of it. And I think the, I think you see governors eyeing that and saying like, I can do policy to to impact the, this, and I'm I'm going to get engaged there. Well, I think if we all get engaged, we all can make an impact on policy. And Nick, thank you so much for flying in today. I really That's appreciate great. it. We are out of time. Thanks, folks. Thank you all.